resolved through the commencement of the evidentiary hearing in case 002-02. There are two items on the agenda. First, responses to the key Sampon's defense team's submissions on the commencement of case 002-02, and second, oral arguments on the scope of the trial in case 002-02. Ms. Sackle-Buti could report on the attendance of the parties at the hearing. Mr. President, for today's hearing, all parties to the proceeding is present, except the accused Nunji, who is absent. According to his defense team, he has no intention to participate in today's hearing. Soon we shall, from the Nunji's defense, who has been requested to be recognized by Nunji, is present, and Simnel Ford, the international lead co-lawyer, is absent, but she kept her seat to many years. Thank you. President, thank you. And before turning to the agenda items for today's hearing, the trial chamber will address a letter from the Nunji's defense team requesting the trial chamber to grant a right of audience to their legal consultant, that is, Mr. Soon Wiesel. The letter from the Nunji defense will be attached to today's written record of proceedings. The chamber is satisfied on the basis of the letter received by the trial chamber that Mr. Sun Wiesel can be recognized by the trial chamber. I now invite Mr. Sonarun to seek recognition of Mr. Sun Wiesel before the trial chamber. Sonarun. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sonarun, defense lawyer for Nun Chi. In compliance with the proceedings and qualification of Mr. Sun Visar, who has been appointed to defend uh, Mr. Nun Chi as part of my team, I'd like to seek recognition of Mr. Sun Visar before the chamber. And that is uh, Mr. Sun Visa, who is uh, standing behind me. Sun Visa, good morning, Your Honors. I am the national uh, lawyer, and I would like to seek your recognition before your chamber. Thank you. President, thank you. And uh, Mr. Sumisa, please uh, stand up. Mr. Sumisa, you are now recognized by this trial chamber as having a right of audience for the purpose of representing the accused Nunchi in case 002. You may be seated. After completing this uh, procedure for the recognition of Nunji's defense, I now turn to the first item raised in the trial chamber's scheduling memo. It's circulated to the parties in advance of this hearing on 7 February 2014. Item 1, responses to Kirsten Pond's defense team submissions on the commencement of case 002-02.
The first item on the agenda concerns the time for the commencement of case 002-02. During the trial management meeting held on 11 and 12 December 2013, the Kielsen Paul defense team reiterated its view that case 002-01 should be finally adjudicated, including the appeals process, if any, before the evidentiary hearings in case 002-02 can start. The Kiel Sampon defense team filed written submissions on this issue on 5th February 2014, arguing that, pursuant to the trial chamber's severance of case 002, the principles of res judicata and legal certainty demand that the judgment in case 002-01 and related decisions be settled definitely before the proceedings in case 002-02 may commence. According to the Kiel and Ponds defense team, the time any such appeals process would take is not a justification for commencing the evidentiary hearing in case 002-02 before the final adjudication of decisions and the judgment in case 002-01. Today, the Chamber will hear oral arguments from the other parties which focus on responding to the Q some party defense teams written submissions. That is document. Document is one zero one slash five slash five and the order of responses will be as follows. Co prosecutors response thirty minutes. Civil Party Lead Co Lawyers Response, 30 minutes. Nunchi Defense Team's Response, 30 minutes. And Kills and Pond Defense Team's Reply to the other party's responses, 30 minutes. And the Chamber would like now to cede the floor to the co prosecutors to respond to the written submissions by Kiel's and Ponce defense team. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. And good morning to your honors. Good morning to all parties who are present here today, and good morning to the general public in the gallery. I would like to present uh, our response to the Kiel's and Ponce defense team's submissions. In the submissions by Kiel's and Ponce defense teams, in particular in document, E301 slash 5 slash 5. It is dependent on the view that case 002 slash 01 and 002 slash 02 are two separate legal proceedings. The argument raised by Kiel's and Pons defense is a misunderstanding. The defense stated in paragraph 53 by stating that the view of the judicial notice based on the adjudicated facts does not form part of the law of the ECCC and also in paragraph 54, the defense also 
stated that the facts debated in 002-01 cannot be used as the basis of evidence for 002-02 until all those facts are considered res judicata after a final judgment by the Supreme Court Chamber on these very facts. Your Honours, your decision clearly shows that the court does not have to rely on the view or observation or the view on the legal view on res judicata in order to rely on the evidence put before you in case 02-01 during the uh, proceeding, the future uh, proceeding in this case. Also in your clarification issued last Friday, that is in document E302-5. Your Honor clearly states that the true proceedings are a continuation of the same case, which means it is under the same investigation, fall within the same case, and it is part of the same closing order. At the same time, your honors also state in paragraph 7 of document E302-5 that case 002-02 and case 002-01 are part of the same trial. For that reason, there is no need for the court to observe the adjudicated facts or the issue of the res judicata when a legal proceeding continues with the same concerned parties. And that is our view, Your Honor. In addition, evidence that has been put before this chamber and Your Honors, and that has been accepted in case 002-01, had been debated extensively. Such evidence has already been placed before your honors in case 002-02, or rather is placed before you. All parties who complied with Internal Rule 87.3 and 87.4 of the ECCC Internal Rules may request to submit new evidence before your chamber. Such process is to ensure the right of all involved parties in the proceeding. Your Honours, the purpose of allowing to have a judicial uh, notice or observations on the adjudicated facts or the principle of res judicata is to save resources. However, in its actual implementation, the court requires more time to implement those views, those judicial notice or principles. The Court of Appeals for Special Courts of Sierra Leone made such a decision in its judgment in the case of Charles Taylor in paragraph 110 of that judgment and allowed to make the following quote. 
generally they recognize that the adjudicated facts are the view formed by other international tribunals pursuant to the rules of those tribunals in order to enhance the efficiency and to make those facts consistent. Frequently, those tribunals cannot make such a decision. The time that has been used to review, to argue on this matter may consume more than the necessary time to present testimonies or to present evidence in an adversarial process. And to quote. Jonas, in our case, the trial chamber cannot save any resources while the chamber is idle and not fulfilling those tasks. While the Supreme Court chamber is drafting its judgment, and on the contrary, it is just uh, plainly to delay the necessary works of this court, and as a result, it means more expenditure is needed. The expenditure which is derived from the funding from the royal government of Cambodia and from the donor countries. And if it is agreed to do so, it means that we reduce the victims, the justice of the remaining facts that they have been waiting for more than 30 years. And I'd like to conclude my response uh, now, and I'd like to uh, see the floor to my colleague, Mr. William Smith, to continue making uh, further responses. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Mr. President. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, Your Honours. Good morning, Council. Good morning, General Public. And good morning to civil parties. Your Honours, um, I would take the opportunity to expand on a few of the points that uh, my colleague has made and also address some of the other points made in the defence motion. At the outset, Your Honours, we would ask that um, you deny Q Sampan's application E301 to stay the commencement of the second trial. His application substantially delays the judicial process, not only against himself, but Nguyen Chia, for no legitimate reason. Contrary to Q Sampan's position, postponing the start of the second trial until after the delivery of the appeal judgment in the first trial against both the queues by postponing, it will not make the second trial fairer or will it make it more expeditious. It will only substantially delay the process, making his further accountability for the crimes charged less likely. You and I'd like to deal with the issue of delay first. Um, if the defence application was granted, and we take into account the length of the appeal process from case file 001, and we also take into account the significantly greater size of the case um, 002-001 by comparison, it's likely that the appeal process for this first trial against both accused will take over one and a half years to complete at a minimum. In the case of the Doik trial, the judgment was issued in, on the 26th of July 2010, as you know, and the appeal judgment was issued 18 months later on the 3rd of February 2012. 
Therefore, the start of the second trial against the two accused would not be likely to commence until January 2016 at the earliest, assuming a judgment in this case by the end of June this year, assuming that. In contrast, if the application was refused and the second trial started in the next few months, it's likely that both the trial and the appeal of case 002-001 would allow a savings of about two years in the overall judicial process um, for these two accused. And that is by allowing the trial and uh, the appeal occur in parallel. Your Honour, secondly, the defence position that the second trial would be expedited if the trial chamber applied the principle of res judicata or the principle of judicial notice of adjudicated facts from the appeal judgment in the first, as my colleague has put it, it doesn't reflect the reality of the application of these processes. My colleague referred to a case from the appeals chamber in the Special Court of Sierra Leone where they discussed the efficiency of the use of these adjudicated facts process, stating that often in practice, <clears throat> by admitting judica adjudicated facts, it takes substantially longer uh, than introducing the documentary and testimonial evidence and subjecting it to debate and cross-examination, respectively. Particularly now that you've honours, your honours have clarified your, in your decision of the 7th of February to admit the evidence of the first trial into the second, the time saved in calling these witnesses and admitting these documents, again, is enormous. We have experienced in case 2 001 that this time will, will, will have saved about one year in the next trial. As to the fairness, the defence have had the opportunity to um, debate the documents and cross-examine the witnesses. And so Q Sampan's right to challenge the admitted evidence in the second trial, subject to recalling witnesses, has been protected. Third, Your Honour, the defence position that the trial chamber is obligated to apply all factual findings of the Supreme Court in any appeal of case 2-001 in the second trial, pursuant to the principle of res judicata, in order to ensure judicial economy and certainty in the proceedings, is not substantiated in law. Under ECC and Cambodian law, the principle is applied in a more limited way than argued by the defence. If we look at Black's Law Dictionary, res judicata means a thing that's been adjudicated. I quote, an issue that's been definitively settled by judicial decision, an affirmative defence barring the same parties from litigating a second lawsuit on the same claim, or any other claim arising from the same transaction or a series of transactions, and that could have been but was not raised in the first suit. So the three essential elements of res judicata are an earlier decision, a final judgment on the merits, and the involvement of the same parties. Under the ECC statute and rules, Your Honours have already held that the principle of judicial notice of adjudicated facts um, is not based in the ECC rules or statute. It only appears once in the rules relating to the powers of the co-prosecutors to exercise public action. Under the Cambodian Procedural Code, the principle of jurist judicata only appears six times in relation to Article 7, extension of criminal actions, Article 12, res judicata, Article 41, file without processing, and Article 264, extension of judicial investigations to other persons, and Article 439, and Article 443. 
Other than these provisions, Your Honours, uh, the Cambodian Criminal Procedural Code does not prescribe the applicability, the conditions and extent in which the principle of res judicata could apply to a lower court dealing with facts of a case in which the same accused has been tried in a higher court for different but related crimes. The Cambodian Code does not provide for that situation. Your Honours, under international practice, it's difficult to find cases where the principle of res judicata is applied in the second trial of the same accused for different crimes with related facts. As to our knowledge, on the, the severing of one indictment into two trial phases has not been done before at the other tribunals other than the ECCC. Consequently, it's only the closely related principle of taking judicial notice of adjudicated facts in other trials of different accused that is extensively discussed at other international tribunals. Albeit this mechanism applies to different but not the same accused, it shares the same rationale as that of the application of the principle of res judicata. The rationale being to ensure judicial economy and consistency of decisions. Your Honours, as can be seen by the practice at other international and internationalised tribunals, judicial notice of adjudicated facts is not obligatory, but it's a discretionary mechanism um, that can be used by a trial chamber in various situations. It's a trial management tool. And so with regards to the use of these mechanisms, such as judicial notice or adjudicated facts or the principle of res judicata um, here, your honours have made it clear that they are not the only mechanisms available to it in order to speed up the trial. Similarly, it's the co-prosecutor's view that based on the state of the law in this area, particularly in the civil law context, the use of these principles is discretionary and not mandatory, as the defence argued. The co-prosecutors and prior submissions have specifically not requested the trial chamber to use these mechanisms in expediting, expediting the trial, but requested that the evidence of the first trial be imported into the second trial in lieu of such mechanisms, as was done by your decision last Friday on the 7th of February, E302-5. So no prejudice can be claimed by the accused. They have been able to challenge the evidence in the first trial and are able to further rebut it in the second. As to fairness of not proceeding after the appeals judgment of the first trial, the defence cannot say it's prejudiced by not knowing as to how the Supreme Court will deal with issues in the first trial. All parties are in the same situation. In their motions, they fail to give one example of how they will be unable to prepare the defence in case 2-2 prior to receiving the Supreme Court judgment in case 2-1. Nor are the defence prejudiced by proceeding without the Supreme Court appeal judgment as any final findings on similar facts subject to new evidence in the second trial can be expected to be equally applied in the appeal judgment in case 2-2. It may well be the case that the Supreme Court's Chamber's judgment in the first trial will be available while the trial chamber is writing the judgment in the second trial and thereby it would provide an opportunity for the defence to challenge the issues and findings with the trial chamber. Finally, and most importantly, the defence will be able to appeal all similar and related issues to the Supreme Court again in case 2-2, providing two opportunities to challenge similar findings. In fact, your Honours, the process of hearing back-to-back -back trials before the appeal in the first trial is more than fair 
as if all the charges were tried at the same time, the defence would not know how the trial chamber or the Supreme Court would finally rule on any issue. However, with severance, at, at the least, they'll have an insight on how the trial chamber viewed issues and evidence. The res judicata principle will not be violated as the Supreme Court will always have the final adjudication on both trials. As to the defence uh, request for a stay of proceedings of the second trial until the appeal judgment in the first, the defence do not provide one case or one authority which supports such a stay, a stay for about two years. Your Honours, the reason for this is that, although rare and, in our, in our view, unheard of in the international system, in domestic systems, cases are severed all the time. Co-accused cases are severed. Counts dealing with separate charges against the same accused are severed or filed separately. In none of these systems is there a rule that the second trial must await the appeal judgment from the first. The reason for this, of course, is that the system would become open to abuse by parties who are simply delaying, seeking to delay the judicial process. Your Honours, the purpose behind the principle of taking judicial notice through adjudicated facts and the principle of res judicata is for the just justice system not to pursue unnecessary and repetitive litigation to save resources and to save resources both time and money. In the current circumstances, no resources would be saved by waiting for the Supreme Court judgment. On the contrary, the delay would waste substantial resources as the appeal judgment is unlikely to be issued for approximately two years or more from today. Your Honour, as a separate submission, and significantly um, aside from the views of the parties and your considerations as to the applicability of staying the proceedings for two years, to apply, apply these principles, um, if appropriate, the Supreme Court has independently ordered this trial chamber to start the trial as soon as possible on the 25th of November 2013, when it issued its second severance decision. The defence have not provided any authority as to why the trial chamber is not bound by this order or should depart from what the Supreme Court has ordered it to do. The Supreme Court has issued a specific and unambiguous order and it should be followed unless there are exceptional circumstances to refrain from doing so. The defence argument justifying the delay of the proceedings lacks merit and consequently does not justify not abiding by the Supreme Court order. To conclude, Your Honours, we submit it's in everybody's interest, the accused who are in custody, the donors who continue to pay more for the court each month, month its completion is delayed, and most of all, the civil parties and victims who have been waiting for 30 years for justice. For the, for the trial in case 2 2 to begin as soon as possible. The Q Sampan motion to delay the start until the appeal judgment in case 2 1 has no support in law and effectively would frustrate the very purpose for which this court was created to deal with the most serious criminal charges known. Your Honour, they are the submissions for the prosecution. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. President, um, judges on the bench, do you have any question for the prosecution? If not, now I turn to the lead call lawyer for the civil parties. You may proceed, counsel. Counsel Pichong, good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours, and good morning to everyone. I will um, 
intervene very briefly, and then Mr. Van Po will follow concerning the uh, appropriate time to commence evidentiary hearing. And uh, due to my health uh, condition today, I cannot uh, uh, take the entire time allocated for the lead call lawyers for the civil party. Of course, the Office of Lead Call Lawyers for the Civil Parties, we have uh, gone through the uh, written submission by the Defense Counsel for Mr. Kilsampon. We do not find any uh, legal basis uh, that is substantive enough uh, that the uh, Chamber shall uh, grant uh, the uh, submission by the uh, defense team. As for the uh, judicial economy, I, we believe that it does not save any court times and resources and it will not contribute to expediting the proceedings. And we are not in the view that the uh, delay of this proceeding will safeguard the interest of the uh, accused. And we are of the view that uh, such a delay will uh, adversely affect the uh, expeditiousness of the proceeding, and we may run the risk of not uh, having the uh, judgment of uh, K002 slash 02, particularly it adversely affects the interests of the civil parties because they have been waiting for a long time uh, for the uh, judgment and they also expect uh, the judgment for the subsequent um, cases. And my esteemed colleague, Mr. Van Po, will elaborate further uh, concerning the uh, submission uh, by the uh, civil parties. The President, you may proceed, uh, Mr. Van Po. Good morning. Mr. President, good morning, Your Honours, and good morning to everyone. Responding to the written submission or request by the defence team for Mr. Kiu Sampon concerning the start of the uh, evidentiary hearing of K002-02, document E3-01-5-5, uh, on behalf of the civil parties, we object uh, this very submission. The arguments raised by the defense team for Q Sampon requesting the trial chamber to decide not to commence uh, case 002-02 before the uh, final judgment of case 002-01. This argument has no legal basis, and neither was it provided uh, for in the internal rule. It does not provide anywhere that uh, the trial chamber has to wait for the final judgment of uh, K002-01 before the commencement of K002-01. And in addition, K002-01 was only uh, part and parcel of the uh, entire K002. Uh, that is m meant to ensure the efficiency of the court. So if we look at K002-01 and K002-02, they are interrelated. They are actually part and parcel of K002. And the internal rule does not require that uh, the trial chamber have to wait until the uh, judgment of K002-01 um, becomes final. And it does not, of course, lead to the the uh, stay of the proceeding in K002-02. The defense uh, team uh, bring up the issue of res judicata, and I believe that res judicata principle does not apply in this context. And 
because the principle of ju ju res judicata uh, does not uh, prevent uh, the uh, stay of the proceeding on the same case. I would like to uh, inform the chamber that the uh, start of evidentiary uh, hearings will lead to the delay of examination of uh, the evidence. Uh, uh, and it will affect the interests of the civil parties, and it will eventually lead to the delays of the uh, judgment of K002-02, and that runs contrary to the interests of the civil party and the expectation of the civil party that the uh, judgment uh, will be handed down uh, sooner rather than later because they have been waiting for 35 years already. Mr. President and your honors, most of the civil parties are very old now. Some of them have passed away. For this reason, it is imperative that this chamber shall commence uh, the evidentiary hearing of K002-02 sooner so that the civil parties can see the justice uh, done for them. As for the accused, we all know that they are at their advanced age at the moment. So in order to ensure justice for all parties to the proceeding, it is important that K002-02 start commencing as early as possible. The President. Thank you. The International Lawyer for the Civil Party, do you have any intervention or observation to make in addition to your colleague? Mr. Pekong, no, Mr. President, uh, none, thank you. The President, uh, thank you. Now I hand over the floor to the defense team for Mr. Nguyen Chia. Uh, to respond to the first item on the agenda. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Your Honours. Good morning, Council. Um, we will be uh, very brief on this point. Uh, we uh, only wish to make an observation uh, concerning a holding in this chamber's recent memorandum E302-5 that we believe uh, bears on this question. Uh, the, the chamber described severance as, and I quote, um, exclusively a trial management tool, unquote, and said that the effect of severance was, and I quote again, to separate the charges which would normally be adjudicated in a single trial into two or more manageable phases, not to create two separate and distinct uh, trials." End of quote. The Chamber furthermore asserted that the Supreme Court Chamber, quote, conceives of case uh, zero, zero 002 as a single trial uh, with multiple parts, unquote. Mr. President, we, we disagree with this characterization of severance and uh, can find no support for it in the Supreme Court Chamber um, opinion cited by the trial chamber. It is clear that case 02-01 and case 02-02 are based on the same closing order. There is no question or doubt about that. But in our view, it is equally apparent that case 02-01 and case 02-02 are two different trials. Case 02-01 had all the characteristics of a trial. The Chamber requested parties to identify the documents they uh, deemed relevant to case uh, 02-01 and considered only those documents for admission. And it called only those witnesses it decided were relevant to case 02-01 and permitted questions only <coughs> within the scope of that trial. 
It heard evidence relevant to sentencing, and it completed the hearing of the evidence and initiated deliberations uh, on the verdict. The Chamber acknowledges that appeals against the judgment in case 02-01 will be available to all of the parties. We must ask the question, how can a trial judgment be issued if a trial has not just ended? How could an appeal against a trial judgment be filed if no trial has been completed? Now, having, having said that, uh, we, we do appreciate Q. Sampan's position and the arguments in support of it. However, ultimately, we do not support uh, the request uh, to wait for case uh, 02-02 until the appeals judgment uh, in case 02-01 because it's, it, is not, it is not what our client wants. Our client is very anxious to begin the trial in case 02-02 and to have an opportunity to tell his story without uh, artificials, artificial constraints on the scope of the evidence. So accordingly, we believe that uh, the case 02-02 trial uh, can uh, and should uh, begin as soon as possible. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours. I would like to add uh, to my esteemed uh, colleague, Mr. Victor Cope, on this uh, same issue. I join with my colleague, who has just enlightened your chamber on the severance of case 002 and the defense team for Mr. Nunjir actually initially did not support the severance but after all the chamber has already decided and we have already proceeded along that line and it was because of the severance it has delayed uh, the overall proceeding instead of expediting it. From the time when the, invest, uh, the prosecutor submitted introductory submission outlining the charges in one introductory submission with one um, document. And now the trial chamber has decided to sever the case into several segments. And they expect that the judgment will be handed down once after another. In other words, that we can expect that there will be several judgments of the same case. And I believe that that should not have uh, happened because I have observed that uh, no any other international court has done so. On a separate issue, I am of the view that from this time onward, the trial chamber may save the court's time as the co-prosecutor have indicated to the uh, chamber according to some of the following reasons. First, the health condition as well as the age of the accused, the two accused, of course, are getting older and their health conditions are 
free now. So uh, their ability to recall uh, their uh, experience uh, is not as good as when they were younger. And that also leads to the um, hearing that does not have the full participation of the accused. And following the conclusion of case 002 slash 01, this is a continuation of uh, the hearing according to the introductory submission uh, by the co-prosecutors. Even though there has been a period of pause between case 002 slash 01, uh, the uh, trial chamber shall commence uh, case 002 slash 02 uh, as soon as possible because that is the continuation uh, of the um, hearing of the uh, charges brought forward by the co-prosecutor in their introductory submission. For this reason, my colleague and I do not agree uh, with the uh, defense team of Mr. Q. Sampon for the uh, stay of the proceeding of K002-02 due to the health condition as well as the advancing age uh, of the accused. I believe that uh, their uh, capacity, retention capacity and overall capacity will diminish uh, at this stage. The President, now I hand over the floor to the defense team for Mr. Kiel Sampon to reply uh, to the responses by other parties to the proceeding. You may proceed. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning to the chamber. Good morning to all parties as well as to the public. <coughs> First of all, I would like to state that I am just discovering the various uh, arguments here by the different uh, parties. Council, please uh, hold on. Uh, there was an issue with the um, interpretation booth. Uh, court officer is now instructed to check with the audio uh, technician and the interpreting booth. President. Mr. Wekang, you may now proceed. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me repeat my greetings to the bench.
So, President and Mr. Beckham, you may now resume. Merci, le, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to greet everyone in the chamber and in the public gallery. I realize that I'm discovering for the first time the arguments of the parties. I have not received any written responses to our submissions regarding my question that it would be necessary to fully adjudicate case 002 slash one and all other appeals before we commence the second trial. I am discovering the arguments of the different parties which may perhaps explain the rather disjointed nature of the reply. I would start with a decision regarding the Nunchia team. I have understood that Mr. Nunchia had expressed the wish to speak up, to be able to respond, or in any case, to express himself before this chamber. That is perhaps justified in view of his health status but as far as Mr. Kyo Sampan is concerned, let me point out here that we are not concerned by the medical examination, which is somewhat abrupt, and which my colleague Son Arun has referred to. Mr. Kyo Sampan is in good health. He is not dying. He is here. He is in good health. So in principle, all these considerations that have been referred to by Mr. Sonarun to justify the position of his client only concern his client and certainly not Mr. Kiyosampan. And we have been saying this for a very long time. And we repeat it here again, the more so as the Supreme Court Chamber when it considered the position it had to adopt after setting aside the first severance order, he did so also mindful of the health status of the accused. And in our position, in our view, it is completely unfounded as far as Mr. Kyo Sampan is concerned. Mr. Kyo Sampan is requesting that we wait for the full adjudication of the case, and he wants to uphold his rights. For the time being, he is in good health, and he would like to be tried in accordance with the principles of law. That is his main request. It is important to recall this because it also explains a number of differences in the positions that have been adopted by the different defense teams. The proceedings today started with the Cambodian prosecution lawyer who immediately wanted to recall that case 002-01 was not an isolated trial. That it was not a separate trial. 
and that regarding 00202 or 002-03 that we are not talking of the same trial. And I am perhaps naive in wondering what kind of severance we are talking of before this chamber. Is it a severance which does not actually result in separate trials? Let me remind you of what the Supreme Court chamber held in its decision dated the 25th of November 2013, E2, E4-4-8, and in paragraph 4, when it reminded everyone of what the chamber had decided to do by severing the case. And I quote, on the 22nd of September 2011, Pursuant to Rule 89 of the Internal Rules, the Trial Chamber issued the severance order by which it severed the proceedings for the first time in K002. It decided to consider it as part of a separate trial and only limited parts of the facts in the closing order were included. And each party or each trial had to result in a finding of guilt. And in, in the case of a finding of guilt, there was going to be a sentence, end of quote. So as far as I'm concerned, when a chamber issues a severance order or issues or dismisses a case, when a chamber decides that a case will end with a decision, either a decision regarding guilt or innocence, and in the case of a finding of guilt, there will be a sentence. And when the chamber renders a sentence, we are talking of a trial that is duly conducted. And the rules of law regarding the conduct of a trial and the rights of the defense that have to be upheld during such a trial have to be respected as part of that trial. This is important. And I note that both the prosecution and the civil parties have shown proof of some form of amnesia. Since in October 2011, when the co-prosecutors requested the reconsideration of that first severance order and the extension of the scope of the first trial, they stated, and I quote, Therefore, what they said, E124 slash 2, paragraph 4, 5, and the following, the delay that will be probably occasioned between the opening of the first case, the first trial, and the second trial, because of issues relating to adjudicated facts and res judicata, this would make it legally impossible to expedite subsequent trials on the basis of J. 
charges as established in the first trial. And I skip part of their statements. Neither principles will be available to the chamber, that is, judicial notice and res judicata, as part of the second trial, insofar as all appeals have not been adjudicated after the first trial judgment. So that was in 2011, and the prosecutors were supporting their arguments regarding extension of the scope of the trial, and what they have stated today is not exactly what they stated then. And the civil parties, in their submissions on the 18th of October, 2011, E124-8, paragraph 27, said the same thing. And I quote, since the prosecution, as, or, as the pros prosecution have stated, the civil parties believe it is very difficult, difficult to organize a series of many trials that would be based on specific charges. The chamber rejected the request. We know that the chamber's position is different. And the prosecutors reiterated their position on the 7th of November, 2012, E163-5-1-1, paragraph 18. When they appealed the decision of the chamber to partially reject the application, and I quote, there is doubt as to the the ability of the chamber to make use of these mechanisms before an appeals chamber decision has been rendered on the first trial judgment. The issues of law that could have an impact on the second trial, specifically pardon and amnesty, modes of criminal participation, in international law, admissibility, admissibility, and proper use of the evidence. End of quote. You therefore see that with both quotes, it is clear that for a very long time, when those submissions appeared to serve what they considered as their interest, the prosecution pleaded on many issues in favor of our application today. That is our request that the appeal process be completed before the second trial commences. I was expecting the prosecution to explain in greater detail why they had changed their position, the more so as they had raised at one point an argument that it was in keeping with a general principle of law that the arguments of the parties should be uh, admitted if they contradict arguments that they had raised previously. That was the response of the co-prosecutors to the Supreme Court chamber in their appeal against the second severance order, paragraph 6 and 7. That argument was completely false, in my view. Of course, the parties 
can change their position in a trial unless they were denied the right of an accused to make an admission I do not understand that the prosecution would support such a position seriously but I am surprised that they have not explained to us today why they have changed their position what I understand is that the true crux of the matter the real problem we face today is the assertion by the trial chamber pursuant to which the first trial would serve as a foundation for subsequent trials you made that clear and repeated it including in your recent decision on admissibility of evidence 305 slash 5 you stated that you consider that case 002 slash 01 will serve as a foundation regarding the adjudication of the charges and facts that are still to be determined so the question that comes to mind is as follows how do you intend to use the first trial as a foundation unless you have ascertained exactly what it is all about how do you intend to use the first trial as a foundation whereas the first trial has not culminated in a final judgment and can be considered as res judicata I personally do not understand and I consider that such a state of affairs would open the door to all sorts of risks biases risks of confusion risk of breaching Mr. Kiyosampan's rights which regardless of the consequences in terms of time management and these issues are in dispute regardless of financial considerations and the Supreme Court chamber pointed out that such issues should not be taken into account you decided the severance and you ruled that the first trial would serve as a foundation for subsequent trials we will have to wait for that foundation to be solidly built before we start the next trial that is pure logic I said a while ago that we were in agreement with the prior positions of the civil parties and the prosecution partially partially because in our view there is another ambiguity there is another extremely serious difficulty which is a consequence inter alia of this creation of the concept of a first trial that would serve as a foundation for subsequent trials and I have already pleaded with regard to this difficulty before this chamber on several occasions it is also related to the issue of the scope of the trial and partially the scope of the second trial but also it is part of the scope of the first trial because today we the Q 
Kia Sampan defense team still do not know what you, the judges, have established for the first trial. During their closing arguments, during their final submissions, the prosecution pleaded the relevance of a system of international law regarding joint criminal enterprise, the systemic form. They pleaded the fact that all of Cambodia had been transformed into a slave camp. Very well, why not? If you wish. But the first trial which ended with these final submissions by the prosecution did not focus on all the events that occurred in Cambodia between 1975 and 1979. Similarly, the prosecution argued that the crimes that are being prosecuted as part of the first trial had been committed as part of a systematic and large-scale attack. And as such, they could be considered as crimes against humanity, whereas all the events that occurred between 1975 and 1979 in Cambodia were not considered during the first trial And for us, the defense, it is egregious prejudice to our client. Because at the end of this first trial, we find ourselves in a situation in which we do not know the scope of the trial, which is drawing to a close. If the prosecution undertook to plead as we did on the score of criminal responsibility and the chapeau elements, it is in regard to us and our client that they undertook to make proposals and suggestions which were adopted by the chamber and which led to this expression, this term foundation. The first trial will be a foundation. This is a very vague notion that makes the prosecution to feel sufficiently at ease and to violate the fundamental principles of a criminal trial at will. The principles that require that there should be a single trial, a separate trial, in which a limited portion of the facts before the chamber are considered and determined, a trial that should necessarily lead to a finding of guilt or innocence and a sentence, and uh, which considers only facts that are part of that first trial. And because of this vague notion, which is badly defined, the notion of an initial trial that would be a foundation, we have a prosecution that keeps shifting its position, its positions, as regards the consequences that the first trial could have on the second trial. And the prosecution says, let us proceed. Let us proceed to the second trial. Insofar as they are still alive, it doesn't matter whether their rights are violated or not. What matters is to make sure justice is rendered for the victims who have been waiting for justice for a very long time. Uh, what matters is making sure that the funds are judiciously used, 
let us proceed and it doesn't matter whether we violate all the fundamental principles of criminal law we refuse such a so-called solution and we have stated for a very long time and our position is very clear and logical and coherent since the very beginning we initially accepted your decision to sever the case and we did not appeal that decision because we were of the view that that would perhaps enable the chamber to determine some of the facts expeditiously but we never we never accepted that the fundamental rights of our client be violated we never accepted that a trial be held on the basis of subject A in order to be sentenced in, on subject B because on that basis we find ourselves today still in a state of uncertainty not only with regard to the scope of the second trial but also as to the scope of the first trial we are also in a state of total uncertainty as to the scope of a third trial since your chamber has decided that those issues will not be resolved today so we are going round in circles we are making the same errors we are stumbling over the same errors it is not a perfect solution but it is the only solution it is the only sincere solution yes, yeah. when we said that the first trial would serve as a foundation for the following one it is necessary to wait <coughs> for the facts that are being tried in the first trial are adjudicated in order to be taken into consideration as such in a second trial and in order to uh, finish I feel like saying that the solution or the so-called solution that was um, built up by the prosecutors and that you have accepted and that you have just accepted recently with uh, your decision of 7 February which you issued uh, uh, regarding evidence seems to me to be a way an objectionable way to avoid the difficulties you are facing that is to say that in the end the prosecutors who are aware of these difficulties that they were raising themselves and uh, that they were even pleading a few months ago now propose to you to take the totality of the evidence of the first case and to throw them into the basket of the second case in order to allow you who have um, adjudicate, adjudicated the first trial to reach the same conclusions as those that they hope you uh, will be reaching but uh, that for the moment uh, everyone ignores and in so doing the chamber will be in a very comfortable position as well as the prosecution in avoiding the difficulty of the necessary res judicata relying on the evidence of the first case that suddenly end up in the second case and therefore we can just continue peacefully and hope that we will move ahead moving ahead moving ahead this is a pretext that is repeated 
to justify uh, the submissions of the prosecution, these are false pretexts. We are moving backwards, in fact. We are moving backwards. It's clear. Now, we have to organize things. We cannot, of course, counter the severance which already exists, but you can nonetheless take decisions that will have less harmful consequences in the future than the decisions proposed by the civil parties and by the prosecution. And this half solution, because there's no perfect solution, would consist in waiting, in waiting and which will, of course, cover you from this extra criticism for having put the cart before the oxen, wait, wait for the rest judicata, since you are telling us that the first case must serve as a foundation for the following one. Wait, therefore, for these foundations to be solid in order to rely on them, and this will also be helpful to the defense because with a definite decision regarding the first case, we will finally know what this first case was made up of, and we will finally understand how the prosecution felt that it was in a position to plead for joint criminal enterprise in a systematic form or for the existence of a widespread and systematic attack uh, covering the entirety of Cambodia following a first case that was only based on, and I'd like to remind you, two population movements and one single execution site. Thank you. The President, thank you. Judge uh, Zalmak Lavenge, uh, you may proceed. Judge. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have a question to put to the Cusson Pont Defense. We have heard your submission. We have understood that you disagree with the notion of severance, such as it is being considered by the trial chamber right now, and uh, you relied uh, on the way the Supreme Court inter interpreted this notion of uh, severance. However, I would like to know how you manage to bring together the reference you're making to the Supreme Court with paragraph 72 of its uh, second decision regarding severance. Um, and in paragraph 72 of this uh, decision, E284-4-8, slash slash the Supreme Chamber provides uh, the following indications, and these indications are very clear. And that encourage, if I may so, the trial chamber to begin as soon as possible and following the final statements in case 002-1 to start as soon as possible, that is to say, the uh, substantive hearings of the second trial. And uh, the Supreme Court was extremely clear in this. It said that we are speaking about reasonable delay and therefore that it is necessary, absolutely necessary, for the trial chamber to use all of the available days for a final judgment to be issued on the remaining charges. So I think that 
this is something that uh, you uh, uh, should uh, react to. Uh, Council Vakian, absolutely. And I believe, yes, that in order for you to understand the way that we understand uh, the decision of the Supreme Court, I think you should backtrack to um, uh, backtrack a bit further in the Supreme Court's decision, and in particular to paragraph 68. In paragraph 68, the Supreme Court is somehow considering contextual issues. It is um, trying to imagine a solution. We cannot criticize the uh, Supreme Court for that. And it is, in paragraph 68, it is considering why the chamber, the trial chamber, is obstinately refusing to include S21 in the scope of the first trial. It was the prosecutors who requested this. And this is how the Supreme Court answered this question that it has, was asking itself. It says, the trial chamber is staying in its initial position regarding the severance of the charges without taking into account the concerns and requests formulated by the parties in relation to the consequences of a new severance uh, for any further trials. And the Supreme Court concludes, therefore, that the trial chamber is probably not ready to consider any other charges or factual allegations that remain that are included in the indictment within the framework of the current trial. Uh, end of quote, free translation. The Supreme Court judges, therefore, took into consideration necessarily the fact that their decision uh, was issued whereas the first trial had already started. This, we are going back now to November 2013. Their decisions were already issued on 23 July 2013, and, and the summary of the reasons as well was presented then. And the Supreme Court issued a decision in a context that was a bit uh, special because uh, the first trial is coming to its conclusion. And it must rule on uh, these uh, matters of severance. So what I believe, uh, uh, Your Honor, is that uh, the Supreme Court is saying here that it notices or it notes that you are not ready, the chamber is not ready uh, to uh, include S21. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, in paragraph 75, the Supreme Court reminds that um, the uh, bench must uh, always act and I quote, free translation, in the sacrum of law, within the sacrum of law. This is an expression that was co used by the Supreme Court, the, the sacrum of law, which means that I do not believe it is possible today to understand the decision of the Supreme Court as an invitation uh, to violate this uh, sacrum of the law. This is not what the Supreme Court wanted to say. Never the Supreme Court wanted to urge you uh, to uh, um, try B uh, in a tr trial only concerning A. This is at least how I see things. It is impossible for a Supreme Court to make such a decision. So in order to uh, uh, finish with my answer, When the Supreme Court states in paragraph 72 that you quoted that the second trial must start as soon as possible and in the best conditions possible, well, yes, of course, the second trial must start as soon as possible and under the best conditions. 
but certainly not by violating outrageously the sacrament of the law, certainly not by moving ahead in a first case which seems still to us unclear as far as its scope. We are not sure. The Supreme Court answered that we should not uh, um, um, challenge you in that way and that we should uh, wait for your decision in the first trial before uh, pulling on all of the alarm bells that uh, we rang uh, as of the month of August. I think it is in August when we filed this request to stay the proceedings. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. We, will, we are waiting, but we're asking for you to wait with us. Of course, you are the main players today. You are those uh, who will be drafting the judgment, but we do not know how you're going to proceed and what is your concept of the first foundation trial, as you say. And we note that the prosecution uh, feels perfectly at ease uh, and does not hesitate uh, to plead uh, concepts of uh, criminal liability that, uh, com that are completely outside of the scope of the first trial or concepts, um, uh, legal concepts, uh, for example, the chapeau elements that are completely outside of the scope of the first trial. So, uh, for, in our eyes, uh, there is a real problem, and I do not believe that we can interpret the wish of the Supreme Court to begin uh, the uh, first trial as soon as possible uh, second, uh, as allowing us to sidestep uh, the fundamental rules of law. The President. Thank you. The time is now appropriate for the <coughs> short uh, break. And the Chamber wishes to advise uh, the uh, prosecution uh, team that uh, you are not granted the floor uh, to reply to the observation by the Defense uh, Counsel for Kyu Sampon. The court is now adjourned. <coughs>